there's always a little challenge when you pick a presentation title, you know, four weeks before you actually make a presentation. So I will try to get to what this actually means in a little bit. I am going to talk about autonomous vehicles, and this is going to be a way too short overview of what's been going on in Boston and Massachusetts at large over the last couple of years here. So people remember Go Boston 2030? Yeah, yeah. So that happened, right? And we came out of that amazing process uh, with sort of three goals. And there was a lot of work that went into this. People actually shoveled out spaces for a box truck, Alice and Marine, uh, to go around and arrive at a vision that we want our streets safer, we want our transportation system more accessible, we want it more reliable. So with any technology, it's not about the shiny object, right? It's about how do you actually use that to accomplish the goals you've already identified. There's been a lot of work to identify these goals. How do we do that with AVs? Well, better access, right? How do we think about autonomous vehicles providing access to people that don't have great access now? A full quarter of the residents in Mattapan takes them over an hour to get to work in the morning. Can we use AVs as microtransit to connect them into better services? Can we run faster headways of, uh, of uh, buses in the future uh, that are autonomous and provide that service in a better way? This is sort of the proven, or maybe the biggest hope, I guess, of AVs, right? Uh, federal government says 94% of crashes are a result of human error. Can we eliminate that from the roadway system and reduce the number of crashes? In 2017, there were 14 people that were killed in the city of Boston, or there 4,500 or so that were injured. Can we eliminate that with a technology? Or can that be a piece of it? A more reliable system. <laughs> so we know that if we are developing a new transportation technology, uh, it's got to work in Boston, right? Otherwise, it's not going to work. So if you remember 2015, the same year we sort of launched that Go Boston 2030 plan, all the surface transportation got shut down, uh, and we were all sort of scrambling to figure out, could we get to work today, could we not? Imagine an autonomous future. We've all sort of uh, started using these services as a way to get us to where we need to go. If it doesn't work in snow, it's not going to work for us. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention here as a framing is around equity. So a few years ago, Amazon rolled out same-day delivery service uh, in the city of Boston. And they said, we can deliver to every single zip code except for these three. We can't get to them with same-day delivery service. Now, if you map that against medium household income, which is sort of circled there, the darker the purple, the lower the income household, it's a pretty dead match, right? They said, we can't serve low-income people. We can't serve communities of color in the city of Boston with same-day service. And it took civic members to get involved, members of the faith community to get involved, politicians to get involved, to call Amazon out on this. And the response was, it was an algorithm, right? We didn't actually check it against populations and demographics. It was an algorithm. So what happens in a future where mobility is decided by algorithms? How do we ensure that it is serving everybody equally? So technology, policy, infrastructure, they all move at different velocities, and they all have different flexibility with them. You don't have to look further than how TNCs have played out in the city of Boston and the Boston area over the last few years, right? Technology shows up, it goes really fast, policy lags to catch up with it, infrastructure is still kind of inflexible. So thinking about AVs, here's the good thing. We have a little bit of a lead time. Uh, the technology, don't believe the hype, it's not here yet. It's on our streets, yes, but it's not perfect. Uh, so we have some time to think about how we get this right and build the right things that we need. Uh, so my grandmother always used to say this to me, so we're at the table on this, right? Uh, and we're doing that. Because the mayor and the governor put out executive orders on the same day. I worked for the mayor, so I'm showing his. Uh, but what it calls out is the ability to sort of begin testing, begin experimenting. Um, and particularly in the city's uh, executive order, a focus on vehicles that are shared, vehicles that are electric, to help us accomplish some of those goals that are laid out in Go Boston 2030. So what does that actually look like? Well, we're focused on... Uh, levels four and five autonomy. I won't get into this too much. It gets really nerdy, but uh, Tesla is sort of down there. The stuff that we're working on is it does not involve a driver to have to intervene in the future. And the things I'm going to cover uh, for the last like three minutes and 25 seconds I have are really around AV testing and street design and infrastructure and some early learnings that we've done there. So it's just the tip of the iceberg. But what does testing look like in Boston right now? Well, there's two companies that are actually out on the roads. They might actually be on the roads tonight, uh, largely in the seaport. Um, Newtonomy uh, and, and Optimus Ride both spun out of labs at MIT. Uh, they both are using uh, electric platform vehicles um, and have been testing for about two years now on Boston streets. 
what's unique about testing in Massachusetts, and this is different from almost every other state in the country, is that municipalities, towns, cities, actually have a say in how testing happens. And uh, that would not have happened if we didn't have amazing collaborators at MassDOT, who sort of brought cities to the table on this from uh, early on. And we've also constructed what sort of looks like a junior's driver's license for autonomous vehicles. It's this phase testing approach. Uh, and this is a sort of a generic version, but essentially you have to prove yourself in your technology in an easy environment. And as you make that sort of proof, it gets, you can graduate into new areas, you can graduate into new uh, conditions, whether that's rain or fog or nighttime driving. Uh, and eventually you can start carrying passengers in those vehicles here in Boston. So this brings me to the LeBron James point. So when the announcement was made that Lyft and Autonomy were going to bring passengers, this was a response from a well-known sort of journalist in the tech scene that said, you can't do this, this is crazy. Um, but that's the exact reason why these companies want to be here, right? It's because we have incredible tech talent, we have really complicated streets, we have very independently minded pedestrians and drivers. Uh, we have all sort of the confluence of things that you might imagine a car would ever have to experience in the world here in this city. Another slightly unique thing in Boston is that we require 15% of those passengers on those trips uh, are somebody with a mobility impairment or a senior. Um, and we thought that was important because this needs to deliver for those people first, right? There's an importance in delivering transportation for people that currently are left out of a lot of those options. In some cases, it's 30% transportation advocates, uh, like in this photo here, if you can make out. But we've taken, uh, we've sort of started trying to bring members of the public uh, to experience these vehicles, to sort of understand what it is, to be able to ask those questions, to be able to bring those questions back to their networks. So the next couple things I'm gonna go through are just some quick learnings on testing, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. But when vehicles started testing in Boston, turns out no uh, seagulls in Singapore, uh, but they are here and they are in the seaport, and they were landing in front of the vehicle and the vehicle was stopping and braking early on. It, it took a while, right? You as a pedestrian or a, a driver or a cyclist would know sort of inch forward and the bird will move. You actually have to teach a car how to do that, right? I'm proud to say that they now know how to deal with seagulls. But there's also some potential for some allies with people in this room, right? If you look at the Venn diagram of probably everyone's interest in this room and autonomous vehicles, there's a couple things that overlap on infrastructure. The first is that unmitigated left-hand turns are hard for AVs. This is really, really hard for them to do. They don't like making that left-hand turn. Guess what? That's unsafe for human drivers. That's why UPS doesn't make left-hand turns. It's also hard for pedestrians in that crosswalk, right? That vehicle sort of guns it and goes through. So do we ban left-hand turns in the future? Do we think about left-hand turn pockets? Separation of modes is also important for autonomous vehicles, right? Uh, they like to know where the lanes are. They like to know where the modes are. Guess what? We all kind of like separated modes too. And this is a quote directly out of one of the reports uh, talking about <laughs> double parking in South Boston. Uh, but double parking in construction zones, also very challenging for AVs. Guess what? They're challenging for cyclists too. So the last one, and I said three, but I'm gonna do four, uh, is, is parking. So we did an agent-based model of the entire city of an autonomous future, and this is a very sort of high-level version of it, but we need about half the amount of parking spaces in that future uh, with a mix of sort of shared public transit, shared autonomous vehicles, and still some private vehicles that are out there running around. Uh, than we do now, which means we can turn that over to parks, into housing, into protected uh, bike lanes, into bus lanes. So that makes me think, and this is really the last thing I'm going to say, Tracy, so, uh, about this, right? We build these environments that impact us, uh, that we use them. So as we think about what the city is we want over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, as we're designing these streets, as we're building these policies, how do we make sure that they are flexible to accommodate new technology like this, but uncompromising in the values that we have set forth as a city to safer streets, to more accessible transportation, and hopefully still really fun places to be as people. Thank you.